the eye of a needle. We find this in Matthew chapter 19, verse 29, and it's a verse I think we're all familiar with. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. You know, before we get started on this verse, there are actually a couple of controversies, and maybe uh, many of us were not aware of these controversies sur surrounding this, uh, this statement. The first controversy is, is this a camel or a rope or cable? And the second controversy is, is this a needle or a gate being mentioned here? Now, when we look at this controversy between camel or cable or camel and rope, um, this controversy is based on the fact that there is a single vowel difference in the Greek between the two words, camelos and camelos. And it's the difference between the, uh, the letter eta and iota. And so this is um, been a subject of, you know, a lot of discussion. If you go out on the internet or look in commentaries, there's, there's quite a bit of discussion about this because the thought was that maybe what they were talking about was putting a cable or a rope uh, with the context of a uh, sailing ship through the eye of a needle. So the question really was with the similarities of these two Greek words, along the line, was there a transcription error somewhere? And so we'll, we'll look at that and see what the evidence points to. You know, the earliest manuscripts, in fact, most of the early, almost all the early manuscripts uh, say this is the word camel. And we tend to, uh, you know, I've listened to Brother Jim's talks on, uh, you know, the, the Bible language and the translations and so forth. We tend to depend on the earliest transcripts the most because, for a simple reason, they these manuscripts were manually copied. They didn't have Xerox machines, so they manually, letter by letter, word by word, sentence by sentence, copied them. And so the likelihood of misplacing a single consonant or vowel, the more copies you make, the more likelihood, the higher the likelihood that you'll have an error. So we tend to uh, rely on the earliest man's manuscripts, and the vast majority of them say camel. So that's a little bit of evidence there. You know, Jesus spoke Ar Aramaic, and Aramaic, uh, as I learned when I was looking at this, has no vowels. So the word camel uh, in Arabic is the same for camel and for rope. Uh, so it's likely that this was first written down in Aramaic and then transcribed to Greek. So was, is this where the error or potential error was introduced? Uh, this seems like a real problem, doesn't it, to all of us? However, <laughs> the, the, words, the use of the word gamala for rope, and that's what's in the uh, dark blue there, the Aramaic, did not start in Aramaic until the 10th century CE. So basically what they're saying, this was not a transcription error from Aramaic because in Jesus's day, this word gamala only meant camel. It was some 10 centuries later that it uh, was also used for rope. And then uh, a little more evidence. There's a parallel idiom in the Aramaic from the uh, Babylonian Talmud. And remember when they were in Bab Babylonia, they, uh, they wrote portions of the Talmud there, they transcribed them. And here there's an expression of an elephant going through the eye of a needle. Now, I don't purport to be a, a Bible scholar. I'm just laying out the evidence that I found. But there's another thing, you know, Brother Jim spent a lot of time very precisely translating the scriptures and RVIC uses the word camel. So for our purposes, we're, we're going to talk about a camel. <laughs> Next, the question is, is it a needle or a gate? 
And to get an understanding about this, we have to look at what a camel gate is. And I think we've all heard the expression. I think the pastor uh, wrote about it in some of his writings. And if you read other commentaries, they talk about a camel gate. Now, I went to find a picture of one, and this is the, the uh, best picture I could find, especially with a camel next to that gate. And so the premise of a camel gate is it was also a pedestrian gate. It was to allow individuals after the city, after the city was closed down in the evening, for security reasons, they would close the gates so no one could sneak in during the night. Then the only way in or out in some of these cities was a pedestrian gate or a camel gate. And the first thing we have to note is there are no ancient references to a camel gate in Jerusalem. None. So we don't find it in any manuscript, ancient manuscripts. We're not talking about after Jesus. We're talking about ancient manuscripts. It was not found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It's not found in the Talmud. It's not found in the writings of Josephus, and it's not found in any secular writings. So there's absolutely no reference to a camel gate in Jerusalem um, in the time frame that Jesus lived, period. And that's, that's pretty uh, significant evidence. But we'll, we'll go on from there. There's a few more things that uh, convince me at least, and we'll present the arguments to you. You can judge yourself as to whether this actually existed in Jesus's day or not. Now, the term camel gate first appears in the golden thread. This is a gospel commentary by Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century. So in the 13th century, there's a reference, and it goes back to a 10th century monk who mentioned it in some notes. And so for the first time, we start to see written down this concept of a camel gate, but it's in the 13th century. Now, this is a popular notion, I guess, and it, it's, you know, there's a lot to be said for it. The, the concept was, well, the camel, you can see him in the picture. He can't get through that gate. So you would have to unload the camel, and then you would have him cush, get down on his knees. He would crawl through. You would take all of his load and pass it through. And then on the other side, you could reload him and stand him back up. And this was commonly used, uh, I mean, in our Christian writings, it's commonly referred to as, uh, you know, unloading the, the uh, burdens of our daily lives in our, in our Christian walk, and then uh, coming through the gate. It's an interesting notion, isn't it? Now, this was so common in the Middle Ages on that William Shakespeare, Shakespeare actually mentioned it in Richard uh, II, Act 5, Scene 5. And he called this the postern of an eye, of a needle's eye. And that really has the connotations of a, um, the, the needle gate, a small gate that you could go through. And so we see from the 13th century on, this became a uh, commonly used metaphor for passing through a very restricted area and uh, bottom line, though, is once again, when we look at RBIC, they use the word needle. And I think rightfully so. Now, it's interesting because the gate picture actually softens what is a very harsh saying here. The harsh saying was that a rich man can't enter into the kingdom, uh, uh, period. Um, that's a very harsh saying, whereas this one, it says, well, well, okay, you can if you unload everything, if you drag it through, if you get the camel to go through and then reload them. But the picture that we have here of a camel going through the eye of a needle is, you know, quite different, quite different indeed. And so we're going to agree for purposes of this talk, and, you know, you may have a, uh, a different thought as well, and that's fine. But for the purpose of this thought, our assumption is that this is talking about a camel going through the eye of a needle. 
Now, when we look to the four Gospels, it's interesting. This account is almost, this particular uh, verse is almost word for word repeated in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But it's not found in John. Now, as we've learned, John often fills in details and facts that aren't found in the other Gospels. But in this case, he didn't need to fill it in. It was already very obvious. And so, you know, with, with three almost word-for-word -word accounts, there was no need for John to comment on this particular scripture. However, we're going to look at the context of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, because there are a few hints as we go through the details, and there are differences and nuances between the three accounts. And here's our three accounts, and you can see, looking at them, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And you see that almost word for word uh, in the Mark and Luke accounts as well. So how big is a camel? <laughs> I kind of smile at this. Um, back in the late 90s, my mother called me up on the phone and said, Bobby, <laughs> I'd like you to find me a camel. Now, my mother lived out on the farm, and they had a petting zoo. And their church also had a uh, nativity every December where they had a full-size nativity where they would reenact, you know, some of the, some of the events there. And so um, <laughs> she asked me to get a camel. So I went on and searched, and I found her. I found a camel farm in Ohio, and they proceeded to procure a camel. How big is a camel? Well, this is their, it's not an infant camel. It's less than two years old at this point. So this was the camel that we got them. Um, notice the size of this animal. I was really not aware of how large camels were until till she got one, until she warned us, never, never, never get between the camel and anything immovable, because if he bumps into you, you could get crushed. They're large and they're heavy. Well, in this particular picture, this is an eight-foot beam, and you see his hump is just a few inches below that. And his head is down, by the way. When they stick their head up, their neck is very long, and so he's more like a giraffe. To give you a little better context, here's that same camel a little later when it was uh, full grown. And you see it next to a full grown donkey. So what we see and what we know is that camels were the very largest animals that were found in Israel, period. And so in this picture, he's picturing the very largest animal with something that's very minuscule, isn't he? Just important to, to lay that out. You know, there's another hyperbole in the, in the scriptures directly from Jesus as well. And we find this again in Matthew chapter 23 and in verses 23 and 24. And in this case, just to frame it up, he was talking to the scribes and Pharisees. And it wasn't going well for the scribes and Pharisees. He was chastising them. He says, woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you pay the tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier manners of the law, judgment, mercy, faith. These ought you have to, to have done and not to leave the, the other undone. And then he, he hits his point. Ye blind guides, which do strain on a gnat and swallow a camel. Now, once again, we have this, this picture of a camel, the largest animal in the area. And he's saying you're straining on a gnat to keep a gnat out, and yet you're swallowing a camel. Now, quite often, gnats are either little specks or can hardly be seen. And he's doing this in comparison to this giant camel. And he's saying, you scribes and Pharisees, you are blind. You're focusing in on 
the little nets in your missing and by by context swallowing a camel wow and so we see this hyperbole and this is another affirmation that you know this is a uh, an indication of size so in the bible we have a camel you know, going through the eye of a needle and in the talmud we have an elephant going through the eye of a needle now you'll remember this portion of the talmud was written when they were in babylonian captivity and what was the largest animal in babylon it was an elephant so we think this is an apt picture and this was an idiom that was used and known among the jews so when Jesus said this, everyone knew what he was talking about. He's saying something very large fitting through something very small. And it was really a way of saying this is impossible. Remember I said that, that the thought of a camel gate had kind of softened this and made it more acceptable. So there was a way for the rich man to get into the kingdom of heaven. He just had to unload everything. But, you know, I think this idiom, if it's the eye of the camel going through the eye of a needle, it's saying that it's impossible. And that's exactly what this idiom meant in the context of the Jews. Now, we're going to look just briefly at some of the characteristics of camels. These are uh, very important to this picture as well, showing that uh, some of the characteristics of these. You know, the camel is uniquely adapted to the desert, more so than any other animal. And in, in Asia, you know, they have uh, bacterian camels, the ones with two humps. In Arabia, uh, almost exclusively, the dromedary camels, the one that my mother had, <laughs> the single humpers. But they are uniquely adapted to desert and desert travel. And when you see their, their feet are very unusual. You know, I've been around a lot of animals and their feet are very unusual. They actually are very soft and they kind of splay out. Almost, uh, you know, it reminds me of the purpose of a snowshoe in snow. You have a lot of surface area so you don't sink in. And what you see when their feet go down in loose sand, um, that the, the foot actually spreads out. So it's uniquely adapted to the desert. They're also uh, adapted to thrive in very harsh conditions. Uh, so extreme heat, no problem. Uh, extreme dry, no problem. Sand and windstorms. Uh, when you look at the snout of a camel and their eyes, they're both, and their ears, they're uniquely uh, designed so that they can close up. So, if you were on a caravan in the middle of the Sahara Desert and a giant windstorm blows up, the camels would cush, they'd lay them down, and they the camels would close their eyes and their, their nostrils would be pinched down so they wouldn't inhale the sand. So very, very interesting. They're also uniquely, um, uniquely suited to walk for days without water. So their hump is a combination of flesh and muscle tissue, and it can absorb lots and lots of water. So a camel can easily drink only every third day uh, when going through the desert. They also are unique in that they thrive on really um, minimal vegetation. In fact, they like to eat thorns and thistles. And I was reminded of this uh, when my mother got her camel. The camel would eat all the thistles in the uh, in the grazing area. So she had a donkey and a camel in the same area, and the camel would eat all of the thistles and thorns and things. Their tongue is very unique in that it can uh, can do that without getting the thistles in it. They are known for their stubbornness, like a mule. Um, this is one of the reasons when you get a camel, you train it very early on um, to cush, to get down and stand up. Uh, you, you teach it very, you handle it a lot so that 
the camel is used to humans. And the reason this is done, I was told, is, you know, camels have a habit of spitting. And they have four stomachs. So whatever goes in there goes through those four stomachs. And if you get them upset, they will spit. <laughs> I've never been spit on by a camel. <laughs> and my mother's camel was pretty good. It rarely spit. But this is one characteristic of the animal. It is stubborn. It is a beast of burden. It is a beast of servitude. You can load it up, as you see in this caravan, with lots and lots of weight. Now, in this particular picture, they're walking across a salt flat. So, just so you know. And in the scriptures, it's a measure of wealth. You know, if we turn to Genesis 30, 43, I have a reference of wealth there. We know that when uh, Jacob came to Esau, he brought a bunch of camels and sheep and donkeys to offer as an offering. It was an indication of wealth. So back to our scenario. And it's important that we frame this up. So what are we talking about? What is the point of reference here? Well, I've highlighted some of the words in each of these scriptures that talk about who was being summoned here, who was coming, and what his situation was. I've created this, a recap. So this is my recap verse that consolidates what's in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And I've got a certain ruler came running and kneeled and said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so he came, it's, in, you know, in some places it just says one, but uh, in Luke it indicates it's a ruler. He came running, he was excited, he kneeled down, he bowed down to Jesus and said, good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And so this kind of sets the scene. We understand he was exuberant. We also understand he used the term good master, which the Lord rebuked him on. But he was asking a question, what do I do to inherit eternal life or the kingdom of heaven? What do I do to get a heavenly reward was the gist of it. Jesus responded unto him and said, why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, and that is God. And we'll stop right there. What Jesus was actually doing here, he was rebuking him because, you know, in a way, maybe this guy was trying to uh, appeal to Jesus and say, you know, you're very good. And Jesus was rebuking him, but more, it was a redirect. He was redirecting him not to himself, that's never what Jesus wanted, but to God. He responds by saying, but if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So Jesus was refocusing him on God and God's commandments. And the response was, he saith unto him, which? Which commandments? And so Jesus was, in a way, testing him. And we'll see what that test was about. He lays out in Matthew, Mark, and Luke the commandments. And he, and he starts with the thou shalt nots. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear wit false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's possessions, anything really, his house, and so forth. And then... He gives the thou shalt honor thy mother and thy father. And really, you know, another way of saying this is love thy mother and father. But then, and this is why we have multiple accounts. In the Matthew account, we've got a little addition here. And thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. So the shalt is neighborly or brotherly love. And so really, he, Jesus added the law of love here in the particulars. And you see the transitions. And so, you know, what was the, uh, this one that came to him? His, his, but what, what was his response? Well, let's look at what Jesus says in Mark 10.21, the parallel account. 
Go thy way, sell whatever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, and take up my cross, and follow me. He did this in two parts, and it's it's a little strange when we look at the construct, because you think he would give all of these things and then say, and then you're going to have treasure in heaven. But he he gives him three, well, he gives him these things. He says, sell, give, sacrifice, and follow. And the first two, selling and giving, then he equates that, that you will have treasure laid up in heaven a spiritual reward. And so he's laying out a formula for us here of a spiritual reward. And then he continues, and he was sad at that saying, and he went away in grief, for he had great positions, possessions. And so what we see here was, here was the response. The sell and the give were a snag to him. He couldn't do it. He was grieved. He was sad. He thought he could essentially get this heavenly reward without giving up his natural desires. Because he was rich in these things. And more so, it's saying that his heart and his faith was in the things that he had. His heart was not willing, and he went away. Jesus didn't send him away. He left. So he came running. He kneeled down. But then when he heard what it would take, he was grieved, and he went away. And then we have our saying, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. Well, what's meant by this idiom? Well, as we've already pointed out, it's a metaphor for the impossible. So a large animal could not be forced through the eye of the needle. It wouldn't be living anymore, would it? Whether it's an elephant or a camel, whatever the largest animal, and you looked at the eye of a needle, these were all symbols that everybody understood. The, a man would say, it is impossible. And, you know, if you wanted the shortened version of this, it's impossible for a camel to go through the eye of a needle or an elephant. It's an impossibility. Jesus affirms this, you know, skipping down a few verses in Matthew 19, 26. With men, this is impossible. And this, again, we'll just jump back to, is this a camel or is this a cable or rope? Well, he was showing it was impossible. Jesus tells us that right here. So we can say with assurance, he's showing things that are impossible to do. But with God, all things are possible. And that's the lesson. The rich man, or the man that came eagerly, had already left. He never got the lesson. It's all about belief and faith. So was Jesus talking about riches in this parable? No. He was not. And this is interesting because if you listen, if you read many of the commentaries or go out online and look what's said, it's all about riches. That's not what this is about. How do we know? Well, it says he was sad at that saying and went away and grieved because he had great possessions. His faith was in the things of the earth, not on the things above. To the natural man, it's too much. You're asking too much. I can't give that up, was what he said. And that was his response. He turned away and he left. To the spiritually minded, the point of reference is that it's my little all. Wow. See the difference? A natural man's answer to a spiritual question was, it's too much. And he was grieved, and he left. 
Jesus' question was to discern if he was spiritually minded enough to enter into the Christian walk. And the answer was no. He was blinded by his wealth. So it wasn't his wealth per se. It was his, his orientation and how he took it. Paul's insights into this. In 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians, he gives us a couple of verses. Then in a nutshell, really, give us the details of this. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. This was foolishness to the rich man because he depended upon the things that he had. Continuing, now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit in corruption. And so it's saying that we need to have a new creature and a new creature mind, and that needs to be the guiding point in our life. The rich man was disappointed. You know, when he was giving us this lesson, he was focusing on the spiritually minded and telling them that only they can inherit the kingdom of God. Let's look at his audience for a second. And this little chart kind of points out what's happening here. He gave them the thou shalt nots. Don't do this stuff. And the thou shalt's. And then he said, sell, give, sacrifice, and follow. These are really counting the costs. And when you think about it, that rich man counted the costs and said, it's too much. The next logical step would be consecration. But that was not yet open. So Jesus was laying the seeds for his audience. His audience was not the rich man that came, but the disciples, because they were the one that asked him. They were interested, and they were not put off by the fact that they had to give up their natural, earthly hopes, ambitions, and desires. So he was showing the apostles the step to a consecrated walk. Were they ready to do this yet? No, they were not. It was not yet time. And yet he was laying out a lesson that would be etched in their minds. And no doubt after Pentecost, they would think back to this lesson and say, are you willing to give up everything? You know, if we were logically to continue this, this is the context of this lesson, counting the cost. But you know, we, there's a future lesson on sanctification and ultimately on glorification. But that's for a future lesson. So we see here that Jesus was laying out these nuggets. He was planting these seeds so that in the not too distant future, the apostles would remember his words and would remember what was necessary. Jesus was teaching them a lesson that soon, not yet, soon, they would understand. This lesson was for the disciples, not for the rich man. It's a lesson for us. It's a lesson for us. Are we willing to give up? And we all understand this progression because we have a perspective looking back, understanding the whole plan of God and what's required for counting the cost for being drawn to God for consecration, for sanctification, and if we're faithful, for glorification. So this is a lesson for us. And it's a lesson we need to remind ourselves. It's not so much about what's in our bank account. It's when it, what's in our hearts, our spiritual bank account. Because he said, with men, this is impossible. You cannot make it. But guess what? With God, all things are possible. Do you ever get discouraged thinking, you know, I'm not worthy. I haven't made enough progress. The goal is too high. And this is an insurance 
in Matthew 19, 26. With God, all things are possible. God wants us to embrace this promise and become more than overcomers. And he assures us that the God of the entire universe with infinite power is right there saying, with me, all things are possible. You can be faithful unto death and receive the crowning glory, glory, honor, and immortality. We thank our Heavenly Father, for from him and through him and to him are all things. To God be the glory forever. Amen. Mm -hmm.